If you're watching this little video message on the day of publication, which is Boxing Day 2021, then I'll entirely understand if you're gazing slightly blankly at the screen through a foggy haze of holiday overindulgence. In view of that, I thought today would probably not be the day to blow your mind with some ultra complicated scientific laboratory research involving words that I had to practice 20 times before I could pronounce them correctly. Now, what I thought I'd do instead is bring you a flight of pure science fiction fantasy, or at least that's what it looks like at first sight. Anyway, what I'm talking about here is power stations in space. Hello, Merry Christmas, and welcome to Just Have a Think. Scientists and science fiction writers have been dreaming about beaming energy back down to the planet from orbiting power stations for decades. The concept was allegedly first considered by a Russian scientist called Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in the 1920s. Since then, the likes of Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke have also offered their visions of how such systems might work. More recently, though, some pretty serious proper research has been going on in places like the US, Europe, Japan and China to actually bring a power station in space into reality. Renewables like wind and solar are becoming ever more important contributors to our grid systems and energy storage is helping with the intermittency problem. But our modern societies need guaranteed 24-7 power all year round. And that's where scientists are hoping that an orbiting solar power station could play a role. Solar panels in space receive direct sunlight with none of the degradation from the Earth's atmosphere and weather systems that panels suffer from down here on the surface of the planet. And satellite orbits can be programmed to ensure they're constantly receiving full sunlight. That's the good news. The slightly trickier part is constructing something large enough to generate a useful level of energy, then working out how to get all that infrastructure up into space, and coming up with a safe and reliable system for beaming all the energy back down to the surface without taking out half of Elon Musk's Starlink satellite arrays or accidentally straying off target and vaporising a small town next to one of the giant terrestrial receivers. It's reckoned that to be cost effective, a single solar power station would have to be about 5 square miles or 10 square kilometres in area. That's about the size of 1400 football pitches, which is an awful lot of rocket launches. Making each component as light as possible will obviously be key to maximising how much each of those launches can take up into orbit. In 2017, researchers at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, demonstrated a prototype solar panel tile weighing just 280 grams per square metre, which is about the weight of a piece of card. Another team at the University of Liverpool are exploring new manufacturing techniques for printing ultralight solar cells onto foldable solar sails, which they say could one day be manufactured using 3D printers and deployed directly from the International Space Station. But the real challenge is how to get the power from space into our terrestrial electricity grids. The basic idea, say the scientists, is to convert the energy collected by the orbiting solar panels into electromagnetic radiation, which can then be transmitted wirelessly back down to Earth via streams of microwaves, all of which sounds perfectly rational and not at all batch crazy. It may astonish you to learn, though, that the science pods have come up against some significant technical issues that are yet to be fully resolved. First of all, the further you transmit a beam of microwaves, the more the microwaves tend to spread out and weaken. Plus, the beam would need to be constantly hitting a precise area on the Earth's surface so that a receiver could catch it and convert its energy back into electricity for the grid. We do already have satellites in geosynchronous orbit, of course. They're used for meteorological and communication functions. But they orbit at about 36,000 kilometres above the planet's surface, which is an awfully long way for a concentrated beam of energy to travel. And with all that spread and dissipation I talked about earlier, you'd need a receiver the size of a small city to capture it all. So the most promising option currently being pursued by researchers around the world is to send up a swarm of thousands of small synchronous satellites to form a single large solar generator. Logistically speaking, that's actually not unlike the 40,000 satellites that SpaceX are currently deploying for Starlink. So in theory, that part of the equation is already doable. 
Each solar panel satellite would send its energy to the same target area on Earth via a laser beam during its orbital pass, with the synchronized array ensuring a constant flow of energy 24 seven. A laser has the advantage of having a very concentrated beam, which is much less likely to spread out over distance compared to microwaves. So although it wouldn't be quite as effective at cutting through the Earth's atmosphere, it would most likely provide a more accurate and focused transfer of energy. And that means the receiver back on Earth could be much smaller as well. Now you might think that something so monumental and fundamental to the future prosperity of the human species, and therefore potentially to all the other species on the planet, would have invoked some sort of non-political, non-competitive, globally coordinated effort, combining all the greatest scientific minds from each country to produce a single exemplary design incorporating the very best cutting edge technology that we could muster as a species for the good of all life on Earth. And of course, if that's how our geopolitical system actually worked, then we probably wouldn't have got ourselves into this climate crisis in the first place, would we? What's actually developing is a frantic race between the superpowers to be the first to get a system up and running in order to achieve overall dominance of the global supply of energy from space. Our friends in China appear to have been first off the mark with this 2015 research paper submitted to Science Direct outlining their concept for a solar space power station, which they call Omega. By the end of 2019, they'd already claimed to be testing a prototype system. And in August 2021, it was announced that they plan to launch a fleet of mile long solar panels into space by 2035 to beam energy back to Earth as part of what they say is their effort to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. Once the array is fully operational, which could take until 2050, it's estimated it should be capable of supplying two gigawatts of power into China's grid at peak performance, which is massive. If you wanted to produce that amount of power using solar panels on Earth, you'd need more than six million of them. In 2020, the European Space Agency launched a campaign to find the best proposals to tackle the space power challenge here, with the best ideas getting funding for development. 85 different designs were submitted, 16 of them have been invited for follow-up, and four have already been invited to submit a co-funded research proposal. So expect to see some progress there in 2022. Over in the States, the team at Caltech received $100 million in funding back in August 2021 for their space power station project. They're going for that modular system of multiple satellites, each of which will be several tens of meters in length, all orbiting in close formation and operating in sync with each other, as I outlined earlier. The team hasn't actually worked out how to collect enough energy to make the venture worthwhile yet, but they're very optimistic that they'll crack that nut. And they're also working on the best way to get that laser beam of energy back to Earth without losing most of it on the way. None of these little wrinkles seem to have diminished the ambition of the project though. Co-director Ali Hajimiri reckons Caltech will be launching demonstrators into space in the first quarter of 2023. And then there's a US space commercialization company called Redwire, who in February 2021 acquired Deployable Space Systems, or DSS, a leading supplier of solar arrays and structures for space missions. They're looking at using colossal mirror-like solar reflectors to concentrate solar energy onto their orbital solar panels, which again will be beamed down to Earth by a microwave or laser. But perhaps the most important question of all is do space-based solar power stations have the potential to help the world reduce carbon emissions by at least 45% by 2030, which is what the IPCC tell us we need to do? And the answer to that question is no, don't be ridiculous. Could it play a significant role in the global energy infrastructure of our children and grandchildren's future though? Well, maybe. And if we did ever manage to convince our wise and noble leaders to wind their necks in and actually cooperate for the greater good of humanity and every other species on Earth, then perhaps spending eye-watering amounts of money on space power stations might just be a better use of resources than some of our other even more delusional projects, like, for example, attempting to colonise Mars. That's it for this Christmas week. I'm taking a short break for New Year, so there'll be no video next week, but I'll be back on Sunday the 9th of January to kick off our 2022 voyage of climate and sustainable technology discoveries. Until then, a massive thank you to everyone who's subscribed to the channel over the last 12 months, and of course to the folks at Patreon 
who continue to keep these videos completely independent and ad free. And I must just give a quick shout out to the folks who've joined since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Chef Wright, Mark Campanelli, Remo Roth, Nancy Schultz, Ron Kleist, Bernard Dare, William Holmes, David Dorsey, Joe Trodden, Ralph Palmer, Dominic Enstrom Glonek, Sherry Matthew, Jonathan Jarvis, Christopher Mills, and Calvin Vett. And of course, a big thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. If you feel you can support the channel's independence in that way, and you'd like the chance to exchange ideas with like-minded folks and help choose future video topics in monthly content polls, then you can join the team at patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can always support us for free by subscribing and hitting that like button and notification bell. You can do that very easily by just clicking down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a very happy and peaceful new year. And remember to just have a think. See you next year.